it in just a minute. No. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmah. Everybody. Yeah, I so listen, I just want to thank Allah for bringing us together. Uh, may Allah be pleased with uh, all our efforts, uh, which has been put forth by the people on the panel here. Uh, I have uh, with us today, we have, um, of course, Dr. Omar Zaid um, and uh, Dr. or Instructor Benjamin Bilal. And then we have uh, a new um, guest, uh, Mr. Omar Romahi. And uh, I want to just begin to say that may, may Allah... Um, when he, when he put us in a condition, he put us in a condition so we could get uh, as a mercy from him so that we can get closer to truth. And may Allah you know, give us a knowledge that is useful and a, a heart that is enlightened. And may we learn from this uh, talk we have today. So um, I'd like to uh, first start off with uh, introducing again, uh, the person who actually put this together starting with Dr. Omar Zaid, who is uh, with us today. Uh, and then uh, after that, we'd like to hear from uh, instructor Benjamin Bilal uh, a little bit about what he might take and then introduce Mr. Ramahi, uh, Omar Ramahi. He also, he's a researcher of Quran and uh, he's completed a book, which is entitled, I believe it's Muslim's Greatest Challenge. And uh, he's gonna get to that uh, once uh, he's on the panel with his talk. So uh, I just like to uh, start out with, uh, in Allah's blessed name, that we He be pleased with our efforts today. I mean, Dr. Omar. Yes, more like a masalam. Thank you, uh, Brother Rosario. Um, we're here to enhance um, <clears throat> our individual and collective bag of knowledge. <laughs> I I I sometimes. Uh, you look at these ancient Babylonian um, uh, and Sumerian uh, models, you know, the, the kings and whatnot that they have etched on the temples. And they, you, you see them carrying a little bag. It looks like a, a lady's handbag. <laughs> and some of these kings, some of these magnificent specimens of manhood, you know, and some of them are giants. They're depicted uh, with respect to the other humanoids that are on there. And they're carrying this little dainty lady's purse. <laughs> and um, that purse is, uh, I'm sure it's symbolic because it's geometric. Okay. And um, so you have the, a kind of a rainbow arc at, at, for the handle, and then you've got this. It's probably the, uh, the perfect rectangle with the, um, uh, the golden uh, ratio uh, underneath. It's, that's my guess. Uh, and, uh, but it represents knowledge, you see. And this knowledge represents what? It represents a reverberation from the universe created uh, by our source creator. Everything that exists uh, comes somehow out of light or emanates light. And all of that exists because of a spoken word, uh, this kun fire kun, this great mystery. And uh, the noetic sciences are expanding on this, uh, uh, this mystery of the dynamics of vibratory effects on healing, on water, on our environment. And um, uh, this needs to be studied. And I think it needs to be studied more by uh, Muslims in particular. The, the Muslims have to return to the heart sciences. And what I'm talking about here is uh, the new physics, you see, that is permeated with metaphysics now, because we're able to experience in physical uh, mensurations, uh, measurements now, uh, what the metaphysics actually are. We can actually begin to see with respect to some of the instruments now that now exist, we can we can see the outcomes of the spoken word. We can see the outcomes of what has to do with this mystery we call them uh, placebo effect. 
and that heals. You see, we we injure the body, the body heals. Well, why can't if we can heal a, a sword cut through the abdomen, we can certainly heal other things as well that are assaulting us. So um, these mysteries need to be exposed, they need to be explored, they need to be expanded, and the people with the metaphysical knowledge of monotheism are best suited, you see, to look into these realms. Not that, uh, not that the uh, people who don't, who speak against faith aren't best suited for it, but they're, I think Muslims are better suited because of their, the mindset which begins with this thing called faith, which the New Testament says, without faith, you can't please God. Well, that's a statement that needs to be unpacked, isn't it? <laughs> and I imagine if you unpack that from a nunetic perspective, you discover all kinds of things that we just kind of take for granted. And I think the sacred space that we enter, whether it's personal or community wise i think that's for, for for prayer or for political purposes hey they're both sacred aren't they yes they are you can't separate the political from the religious realm and if you do that that you then you're going to abandon morality for sure so this these sacred spaces there seem to be reserved for separate approaches to the metaphysical metaphysical understanding of our position in the earth our, our position as living human beings so i'm in, very interested to explore this realm uh with uh, our present panel especially with dr uh ramahi professor ramahi from you're out of waterloo waterloo university in ontario i believe and um Pro professor ramahi has a particular perspective that's based and sound and founded in sound knowledge of the, the sciences as well as the metaphysical aspects of this thing that we call islam that this thing that uh, uh, Brother Bilal calls Al-Islam, which is a little bit different and set aside from nunetically from the term just Islam itself, you see. So what is this sacred space? Is it a tribal center? Is it a place just for ritual? Is it a place where individuals and the community celebrate uh, paths of remembrance? Paths up or in orders. What, why? What are we remembering? I mean, the the Quran says, uh, you know, I'm I'm just a reminder. I'm sent as a reminder. So, what are we remembering? We're remembering this path uh, of return to our source Creator. And what is that path? The purpose of that path is to become the full, fulfilled human being. You see. And instead of using this sacred space to wait for a hero or for a messiah to do this, uh, hey, uh, I recall an Old Testament um, statement that says, hey, I've selected you to become a, a nation of priests. It doesn't just say the tribe of, uh, of, of Moses' brother, I'm, I'm Imran, was it? I, I, no, not just that tribe, not just the tribe that became the priesthood. Okay, no, we're all supposed to be priests. And if we're all supposed to be priests, you see, that means we don't need priests. <laughs> but if we don't need priests, why do we need a sacred space? And who's supposed to stand, you see, in that hollow? that everyone, including pagans from the ancient days, have placed in these sacred spaces to represent their god or their demigod or their prophet or their messiah, their particular approach to the son or daughter of God, their Madonna. That's what that represents in the corner. Now, so that's borrowed, you see, that place in the masjid, when that where we call the Qibla, that's kind of borrowed from the ancient pagan temples, which have created their 
sacred spaces. And all of these sacred spaces where such a hollow in the ancient days was filled up with a god, a false god, you see. So what have we done with our sacred space when we borrow from pagans? Okay, Christ is borrowed from the pagan, the idea of the sacrificed human being. is borrowed from the, the, the idolatry that preceded him. There were 30 Christs who were born of virgins, <laughs> died, crucified, went to hell, were resurrected. Jesus wasn't the first one, you see. And I, I wrote in my book on Trinity and a little dissertation meditation on this concept that, well, geez, the Jews finally got the right one. <laughs> you see, that's, if you're going to believe that gospel, that's, what it, that's, what, that's the only conclusion you can come to if you know the preceding history. Ah, but that's another aspect that's lacking, isn't it? There's a knowledge deficit, and that brings me back to these great Sumerian gods. They're carrying this handbag <laughs> that I talked about. It's got a key in there, and they keep that key of knowledge. Okay, so I've opened up a can of worms here, <laughs> Brother Ramahi and dear, dear Brother and Benjamin, okay? I'm opening, I'm purposely opening up a can of worms here because I want to expand this conversation according to meditations which I've had, but I'm not having any meditations that haven't gone beyond what most men have imagined themselves. What is this all about? What is that sacred space for? What is this so not all about? What is that we have to have ritual? Ritual is important to us because it establishes habits. So what habits are we establishing if we're honoring the ancient sacred space for a false god, a false messiah? You see, I hope I'm making some sense to you gentlemen. And uh, with that having been said, I would like to remind us that, yeah, right, sacred rights, they refer and they defer in the present day to priesthoods and their doctrines. And I don't care what your, your faith is, you got a priesthood there. And according to what Moses uh, writ, wrote in, I think it was Deuteronomy someplace, and he's speaking about the, the tribe of, um, uh, what, what's their, I'm, I'm blocking on that, uh, on the word there, their tribe of priests. We're all priesthood. Because the word there, the, the phrase, I've, I've selected you to be a nation of priests, not just one tribe of priests. So that means all of you, all of you. And Moses is especially talking to the men. Not that the men were selected above the women, but the men here in this sort of generic sense means a position of authority. You've been handed the authority. You, you, you're the ones that holding the staff. Yeah, the men hold the staff, and when women hold the staff, it's not the ideal, is it? Of course, it's not. They can do it, but it's not what they're created to be. So that means if we're deferring to just a, a particular group of priests who identify themselves as priests, for example. Like they have their all their different orders and they have their nuns and all this sort of thing. We have all our imams and we have all of, all of our, in Islam, we have all these imams, all these matabs, all these sundry sects, 72 of them, I suppose, as, as, or thereabouts. So if we're referring to them as priests and their doctrines, and they've got this sacred space that's been taken from the ancient of days, okay, and the ancients have all reserved that sacred space for lies and liars, I think we are abusing the sacred space. I think we're not using it correctly. And we're using it to contain the people within a particular, how shall we say it, stockade, <laughs> rather than a holy place. All right. So 
we imagine the the the, the Sioux Indian, the, the the shaman going out into the mountain. He finds a sacred space. Where where did our prophet meet Jibril? It was in mountain music. That was a sacred space up there. And we all know that indigenous peoples all over the world, they have a sacred place. They have a sacred space. They have a sacred tree, whatever they consider to be that sacred place. And what is that doing? They're trying to find their own way, their own path to remembrance so that they can become the true human being. They're trying to return to their God, our source creator. So everyone's trying to do that. If they get off track and they start worshiping a false God, then that kind of begins to reserve that sacred space for false doctrines, you see. So I'm sensing here in, in response to my own remarks here that these sacred spaces, they act as containers and they have a memory and that memory is transferred from generation to generation to generation, just like the, uh, the, the idol has a memory attached to it. The symbol, the flag has a memory attached to it. Okay. All of that has a memory attached to it. So we have to be, I think, very careful what it is that we place in these sacred spaces, dear brothers. And with that having been said, may it please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I have spoken correctly. And uh, I wish to hand the microphone back to our gracious host, Angelo. Oh, okay, brother. Yeah, I just, um, I did want to mention, uh, are we going to focus more on the Islamic uh, sacred space? Uh, or are we going to touch on also some ancient indigenous uh, cultures like the Temple of Delphi in uh, ancient Greece, because that's still alive today, and people go there like almost like in Mecca. They have millions of people go there every of year. Course. Of course, uh, I'm not excluding anything here from the conversation. Yes, I think yeah. we have to be all inclusive in order to approach uh, 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 it, what we call a tawhid. Yes, I agree. Well, great. Uh, Benjamin Bilal, do, do you, uh, brother instructor, you have any comments on this? Sure, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hear it, brother are, man. Are you, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm, not here let's have it, man. I'm not here to eat popcorn and look at the movie, man. I'm here to be. <laughs> well, yeah, lay it down, bro. All right. And yeah, thank you, Angelo. It's good to see you again after uh, some time. Yes, and, likewise. Course, my good friend, Dr. Ramahi, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you once again. I look forward to a one-on-one -on -one in the very near future, inshallah, if we can work that out. And Dr. Omar Zaid, of course, week after week after week, we're just laying foundation for a wonderful, um, yeah, I would call it an exhibit of newfound truths mm. that all of these parties here are involved in. We're actually in the... Um, in the business of creating a whole new linguistic world, not just for Muslims, for anybody who considers themselves to be a thinker, a believer in a source creator and the dignity of humanity. We're contributing to all of that green, green produce that's happening right now, right in front of our eyes as we speak. It's a, it's a great day for us is what I'm saying. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna leave uh, the topic of Juma for our guest, Dr. Ramahi, and I know he has quite a bit to say about that, but I will speak to the word sacred, mm. sacred space that you've been discussing, Dr. Zaid. And I'm going to approach it from a linguistic vantage point and uh, inform our listeners of where the English word sacred actually comes from. It comes out of the Hebrew language, actually, from the word sakr, S-A-C-R, sakr. And sakr is the English equivalent of what the Arabic language calls dhakr. 
and all of us should know that zakar is the word for the male not the female the male and uh another related word to zakar is zikr obviously mm-hmm. and zikr means what you just mentioned in the word remember or remembrance mm-hmm. so remembrance <clears throat> therefore if we follow this logic to its logical conclusion remembrance is in something that the male brings the male brings a particular genetic contribution that has maintained a connection to everything in that human being's past mm. is contained in his sack you get it sacker mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's where the so see zikr to the point <laughs> huh straight to the point yeah 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 we're all men <laughs> uh, not excusing the females who are listening in the in the audience they are understanding mm-hmm. this also but yeah. uh it's not that there's some male superiority thing going on in this language it is differentiating roles that are more connected to spiritual ideas than to biological ideas mm-hmm. and we know that the sacker the male the scrotum the spermatozoa and all of those things are containing genetic memory mm-hmm. that is being inherited by future generations that is being passed on as memory genetic memory and this is true for every human being the baby comes in knowing how to even suck its thumb and mm-hmm. who's teaching the baby how to grow hair all of that is a part of genetic memory who's teaching the baby how to blink it's not his mother doing that mm-hmm. it's something that Allah created in the fitra in the 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 natural patterns that he clocked into everything that he created he created its fitra along with it so sacred <clears throat> represents those things that are worthy of being passed down mm-hmm. So if we're involved in behavior that we know is not worthy of passing on to the future generations like a lot of this foolishness you see happening in the world right now, would you teach that mm-hmm. to your children? Mm-hmm. Would you give them these books that they're allowing now into these public schools mm-hmm. to teach your no, child I, about gender differentiation? No, no you way. You wouldn't pass that no, down. No, I've your seen common, them. Your common sense knows that that's not worthy of carrying into the future as ideas for our children and our grandchildren to, to, to ponder. And to build yeah. a life upon so these things are not rocket science for us i don't mean just as mm-hmm. muslims i mean as anybody who considers themselves to be a thinking person in this world yes certain things if you want to do that in the corner of your own world then okay that's your corner of the world mm-hmm. but not to get into a different subject because it's the same subject yes <laughs> people who are of the sacker type or the zikr mm-hmm. type they mm-hmm. it means to remember so mm-hmm. what are we remembering look at what Allah says all throughout the Quran when he tells us to remember when and he tells us about civilizations that were greater than yours that are now underneath the ground and you are not hearing a peep out of them yes. and they resemble in their behavior exactly what you see happening in the world today so what's the natural course for this world if they continue to follow that thinking and that behavior so mm-hmm. we have to become sacred in the truest sense of the word and i mean that for males and females we have mm-hmm. to find a sacred space but the sacred space can't be in the mountain not at first it can't no, be inside. in the masjid it can't be in a physical place a temple not mm-hmm. at first before humans ever thought about establishing a physical place as being sacred they had to first tap into that sacred space within themselves Mm-hmm. Yes, Allah will not change the condition of a people until they change within themselves. There you go. And also, Inshallah. Inshallah. Khalaqna insana fi asani taqweem. Certainly, we have created the human being mm-hmm. fi in, inside the most excellent mm-hmm. asanu taqweem, asanu taqweem, mm-hmm. in the most excellent of organizational designs. There's nothing, no other life form that is as uh, intricately built as the human species. 
not in its intricacy. And all of that mm. is taking place inside of us because it's not just speaking to our biology, it's speaking to our psychology, it's speaking to our neurology, it's speaking to our spirituality, it's even speaking to our nervous system, it's speaking mm. to our instinctive drives. All of those things have create have been created by Allah in the most excellent of organizational designs. So that's mm. the sacred space that I that I'm addressing now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Personally, I don't care about a sacred mountain. I don't. And if Allah cared about a sacred mountain, he would have mentioned Hira in the Quran. How, how do you know that's true? That he received the first revelation in a mountain that subsequently became called the Hira. How do we know that? And if that's so important, how come Allah didn't put it in the Quran right next to Iqra bismi rabbi kerledi khalat? He could have mm -hmm. said that Muhammad say from the cave Hira. <laughs> but here is no different than many of the other historic mythological mountains that they say people received these kinds of blessings and spiritual insight on. That's not a new story. All right. We want to stick with what is in the Mus'haf. We want to stick with what is in the Quranic frequencies that we're supposed to be registering internally. So I could make Harlem, New York, my sacred space. I don't have to spend $5,000 to go to Mecca to find a sacred mm -hmm. space or to go to ancient, uh, to go to Greece and study the ancient temple at Delphi. I don't have to do all of that. Parnassus and all of these mountains, most of which yes. are mythology. I don't have to do all of that and spend all that money and waste all of that time trying to find a sacred outward space when I haven't found the sacred inward space yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's a symbol. I spent, spent, I spent yeah. thousands of dollars looking for all of these spaces and places in the world that they told me if you just touch this and do that and go around it seven times, that all my <laughs> sins, will, all my sins will be forgiven. No, brother, you're missing, you're missing, you're missing, you're missing the shopping experience in my. <laughs> I, I, have yeah, a yeah, shop, I have a better shopping experience in Harlem. <laughs> when those yeah. guys from Mecca come to America, they look for Harlem. They look at they, yeah, You see right. what they're wearing? Yeah, they're wearing what mm. they're to wear in the, in the But can I, can I say, well, brother, brother Bilal, can I say that? Um, but the, these, these, these uh, buildings, these, these, uh, how do you say? These symbols are actually a ways to also remember. Uh, like, I mean, it's not to be taken literally. For people who know, they they know that that's a symbol because in ancient Egypt, I mean, people still go there all the time. But the Egyptians were symbolically representing spiritual principles uh, for us to remember throughout the ages. You know. Yeah, but cultural manipulators have designed this world so that you feed into their pocketbooks, or that they yeah. feed into your pocketbooks. So I don't mm -hmm. buy that garbage about there being a sacred place. I don't care mm -hmm. if you say Mecca, Medina, it's no more sacred than Brooklyn, New York. How do I know <laughs> that? Because Allah calls this earth his masjid. That's mm -hmm. right. The yes, whole sir. earth. What's excluded if he's calling the whole earth his sacred space? Mm -hmm. The cosmos right. is his sacred space. We're still trying to find out and peep into that and see what's out there for us. So yes. what I'm saying is that it has become commercialized. Right. Now, I'm not saying that there's nothing there worthy to go study. No, Allah tells you go and venture out and travel and see what was the end yes. <laughs> of the people before yes. you. Not the right. future. There... What was the ends of the people who came before yes. you? Yeah, and it's many a ghost of them, Allah, says, Allah says many of them were established on a much higher platform and of more importance and have done greater mm -hmm. things in, even in technology than you yeah. have yeah. done. That's, That's to right. humble you. And to have you go back inside and investigate the sacred space that Allah created in you when you popped out of your mother's belly as as a, an innocent, pure human. So I'll leave it there until I hear from my friend. I'm through. <laughs> Can you All hear right. me? So who's next? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, it's be, Ramahi, you're still ready? Is it there, bro? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Or yeah. I, yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. I think the the camera froze up on my end. Is your is your guy's camera working all right? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes, yes, uh, brother. Uh, one more time, salam alaikum. Um, this is uh, you know, Doctor Omar. You brought a very very important uh, subject, and and I don't know 
it's coincidentally or there's some hidden forces, but just about uh, uh, three weeks ago, believe it or not, uh, I got a request to submit an uh, academic paper to a Muslim conference, a, a conference that is dedicated to Islamic subjects. And, uh, and guess what? The topic mm. is <laughs> Islamic spaces. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mm. I was very surprised. I don't know, is there someone listening or something, whatever, but it's, it's an amazing, amazing topic. But, uh, but uh, th there's so much to say about this subject. And, and uh, first of all, you know, uh, the, the concept of uh, sacredness or holiness, okay, these two are conflated. Um, if we want to go back to, 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 to the Mus'haf as our reference, mm -hmm. uh, the most important thing is that to notice that this concept came in the context of protection. It's a very practical concept, very practical. Mm -hmm. There's sure. an impact to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and that the, the, the first occurrence is in the Mus'haf al-Masjid al-Haram. Now, what does Haram mean? Al-Masjid al-Haram, right? Al-Masjid al-Haram. There is that Allah is referring to a space, a place that is occupying space that Allah refers to it as al-Masjid al-Haram. فَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا Whoever enters it became protected and secure. And this is the beginning, the, 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 the most important reference or significance to a space happened in the story, the Qasas of Ibrahim. Okay, so uh, so the, the one can extrapolate, but what was so special? Notice that in the in the context of, of Ibrahim stories, there mm -hmm. were two interesting things that can be connected. One is the emulation. You know, he wanted to emulate mm -hmm. uh, 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 his son. Yes. You know, the, the Quran didn't say didn't get into this trivial thing whether it's Ishaq or mm -hmm. or or, or uh, Ismail. You know, Muslims yes. and Jews are fighting was that he is the one who was to be mm -hmm. sacrificed. That's not the point. The point is that he was about to sacrifice his son. And uh, and this is what the Mus'haf is telling us. There's nothing metaphorical about it. He brought him in, الجبين, and he wanted to slit his throat. Now, uh, Ibrahim, and, and you'll see the connection in a second, Ibrahim, uh, and, and this is a fascinating I, I, the credit goes to Muhammad Shahroor, who made us think about this. I mean, this man is a yeah, mm -hmm. you okay. know, because he said, uh, uh, ara fil mana. You, you see the connection. I'm not talking about emulation here, but you see the importance connection to protection. So, inni ara fil mana. I am seeing in my sleep repeatedly. Look, inni ara, not inni ra'ayt. In the case of, of Yusuf, I saw. Once you sleep, you find something. But in the case of Ibrahim, he kept seeing something in his sleep. So he got the message that this is a command from Allah. Not once, not twice. In the ara. Every time I go to sleep, I see I am immolating you. So, you know, and of course, uh, the son, whoever that son is, Ismail or Ishaq, said, uh, do what you're commanded to do. If not do what you think you're supposed to do. Look, if al ma tu'mar, do what you're commanded to do. Okay. Mm. So now Allah replaced it with an animal. Okay. So what was the, the message here is that before, and this is what anthropologists have verified and historians, is that they used to emulate people. You know, the mm. altar. Uh, yes, which, of course. You know, with, with altars before, they used to basically emulate people, job the mm. people for the gods. Okay, yes. so mm -hmm. the transition, this is the significance of the story of Ibrahim, one of the most significant, not the only one, is that there was a transition. Allah made that transition the first time in human history. Don't emulate people, emulate an animal if you want mm -hmm. to. Okay, so now there is a protection, there's a more significance to the human entity, to the human before people would sacrifice people okay mm -hmm. so this is a major jump a quantum jump to say wait a minute everyone is significant we cannot do, do this and second is that whoever enters this al-masjid al-haram is is secure sacredness here what whatever sacredness means but in the in the arabic it's al-haram muharram muharram means 
what is prohibited he you see muharram haram has a context every we know that every word has a comes in a context muharram means different things but if you look at it in the context what are you not supposed to do in this uh, in this you're not supposed to kill there's a protection this place if you enter it you're safe so here the first reference to al masjid al haram okay mm -hmm. now that's it the, there's another reference in, in the Mus'haf, and I stand to be corrected, okay? Mm -hmm. The reference is Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Ladi Barakna Hawla Irrespective, irrespective, and, and whoever uses this to manipulate this point politically, that's, that's absolutely unfortunate, it's very unfortunate. But the point that I want to focus on is Al-Ladi Barakna Hawla Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Ladi Barakna Hawla Barak is is you know when people translated is into blessed okay in arabic barak from from wholesomeness completeness allah tabarak allah he's mm -hmm. complete that's what tabarak in fact in still in the middle east in some old in some villages they say this food abrak when you invite someone you know someone stops by and you will not mm -hmm. you will not invite them and you're worried if the food is enough mm -hmm. You said the food is abrak, means that it really covered all our needs. Okay, mm -hmm. so it has to say with completeness. These two references, al Masjid al Haram, al Ladi Barakna, sorry, al Masjid al Aqsa, al Masjid al Haram, from the Dakhlahu Kana Aminan, and the other one, al Masjid al Aqsa, Ladi Barakna Hawlahu, there's only reference one to protection and one to completeness. So, where is let's go back to the point where is this concept this policy is that if you go to a certain place and i i, I agree with my brother Bilal, 100 you go to a certain place and if you happen to do a certain form of quote unquote worship you get seventy thousand uh, uh seventy thousand rewards so they attach the concept of reward to a place and mm -hmm. and you know in physics it's very interesting physics and and space are tied together so they also attach the concept of edger to time we cannot separate the space from time they attach the concept of edger to space and they attach the concept of edger to time so my always my, my argument and i had i had i don't know the privilege or the fortunate you know my fortunes i i went to mecca many times and i made Umrah. and i can you know we can leave it to another episode or discussion what did i feel what did i get out of it that's a different mm -hmm. subject but my point is that i always think about this and i saw rich people rich people s sitting in this five star seven star ten star hilton overlooking the uh, overlooking that kaaba uh, you know it makes me revolt really it's revolting mm -hmm. these people are you telling me these people are getting tons of azure because they're not missing any prayer and i see them the way they go down up and down up so that they don't miss any collective prayer. And a poor, pious woman in Palestine, my homeland, who cannot afford, okay, uh, to travel to the, the major city in Palestine, uh, let alone to travel, to, she cannot be rewarded. I mean, this is, you know, she, she does not have the reward because she, she will not give the reward, but that rich man or woman who can fly first class and stay in that hotel will get that reward. It doesn't click. It doesn't click. You know, <laughs> you know, if we want to stretch it, it means that Islam is a purely capitalist religion. It favors those who have capital. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't <laughs> click. It doesn't click mm -hmm. at all. You know, from a basic so so you know, so so I saw people acting in a in a bizarre way in Mecca. I will never forget this incident. I will never forget. We were coming up the escalator and the woman also got trapped, tripped, and she almost fell because someone was telling her, sister, sister, I don't want to miss the prayer. And I have a very good Saudi friend. We went to Amra together. He told me, look at this, which is more important. I mean, he should be helping this woman, waiting for her, but this man is focused on the edger. So, you know, this destroyed us, this concept of edger destroyed us now, let alone other aspects of, of wasting, I mean, it, wasting money. Imagine, you know, uh, uh, to, you know, from North America to go to, to do Hajj, uh, I'm mm. not talking about the, the Hajj as per se or the Amra, that's a different subject, the importance of it or, or lack of, but it cost about $14,000. 
You know $14,000? You know what you can do in Gaza with $14,000? <laughs> you can feed a clan for one year. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, Allah, Allah, if we try to understand Allah's character, who, who this Allah is, we just need to dig deep in the Quran and to see this, this entity is a very passionate, very compassionate, very soft soul, if you want to compare it to, you know, very soft soul. Look at this. You know, he's okay. talking about Yatin. He's so caring for the orphan. You know, he's not interested in whether we enjoy women or not. That's the last thing on Allah's interest. <laughs> you know, you want to enjoy, enjoy. But his interest is that compassion. And and we, when we start looking in these aspects, we say something is not right. Something is not right. Now, look, I mean, I, stop me when, when you feel like it, but there's so many issues here that one doesn't know. First of all, you know, it, I was recently visiting a so-called sacred rock in Ontario. Sacred rock by the natives. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not good in these. Uh, it's, it's called the Petroglyphs Provincial yes. Park. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I went there not knowing what's in there. You know, mm -hmm. we were recommended to go there. There's something interesting. And the rock uh, is, uh, what? it's just a rock. It's just mm -hmm. a rock. You know, legacy yes. with history, they made it something. They made something out of it. And and I'm not disrespectful of the natives and their and their religious beliefs. I'm not. I'm very respectful. But I had a very nice chat with a native woman who they made they, they appointed her as a as a guide. Mm -hmm. We had a fascinating discussion, you know, and and I started telling her, look, I respect, but what is this? This is just a, a, a stone. With time, with time, people gave respect to that stone, you know, and that stone and, and by patronizing the natives, you know, we, we created a park for them and we told others, be careful, there's a stone there that the natives respect. Yet we're still, we're, we're chopping land, we're taking, we took all their rights, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I look at, at, uh, at the similar stone, there's a similar stone to that. Guess where? Under the, the Dome of the Rock mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. The, it, you know, it looks so similar to that stone. Amazing, mm -hmm. and people think that the prophet ascended to the to the heavens from that stone and all that. The, the, all these legends, and people think that if you go there and pray in that place, you have I don't know thirty thousand. I don't know who quantified these <laughs> thirty thousand. Uh, uh, thirty uh, thirty thousand. Now, this is you know uh, 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 th this is has to do with, in my opinion, it has to do. I think Brother Bilal mentioned, uh, uh, touched on this. It has to do <coughs> with power, mm. because because the, the the Dome of the Rock was was created, in my opinion, as an alternative to Mecca, mm. as an alternative to Mecca, because of the when mm. the Amawit took hold of power, they shifted the center of government to Bilal mm -hmm. Isha, which is uh, Syria, Palestine, Jordan today. Sure. And they wanted to have something similar so that people will, you know, will mm -hmm. circumambulate around him and around it and so forth. Mm -hmm. So look at the parallels. Uh, uh, you know, uh, brother uh, uh, Angela, you mentioned is it uh, is it uh, related only to Islam? It's impossible to disconnect this subject from from mm -hmm. from uh, the way humans progressed. You know that what yes. you know, Omar, Dr. Omar talked about the the, the priesthood, the the, yes. the space that gives rise to the priesthood. You know, if so, so there's commercialization. If you look at uh, the 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 places in 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 uh, in um, Iran, uh, Mashhad, Mashhad is a commercial entity. Qom is a commercial entity. You know, if uh, the, the commercial aspect of Qom and Mashhad, the, the commercial implications are huge. If you want to create mm. a revolution in Iran, uh, affect this commercial these commercial enterprises. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Commercial enterprises. And it is not a, uh, it's not a secret that the Saudis, the so-called guardians of the holy places, have mm -hmm. made a commercial bonanza out of, uh, mm -hmm. out of, uh, you know. And Allah mentioned that in the Quran. You know, mm -hmm. al -hajj, uh, al -haram. Did you make these aspects of feeding the poor and and giving them water? It's like you know, mm -hmm. we know all that. So, qum Karbala, qum. Karbala, Mashhad, yes. uh, mm -hmm. Jerusalem, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, talking, I'm not, uh, don't get mixed with the political implications. We can talk yes. about that separately. Yes. 
You know, Jerusalem mm. is absolutely occupied territory. It has nothing mm. to do with Islam or the lack of. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and, if I could. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to mention. Uh, I know we could talk. This is a whole big subject, and it's great. I mean, I, I I'd like to. What you're mentioning is about the 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 use of power, about these um, crowds of being used to implement this power. You know, you know, you know the quote: the the vulgar crowd always is taken by appearances, and the world consists chiefly of the vulgar. <laughs> you know where that comes from? That's Machiavelli. So a lot, yes. this Machiavellian concept has seeped into, unfortunately, even uh, Islam. I hate to mention that because I come from a Catholic background, and I've seen mm -hmm. how in the Vatican, there's even more dignity in the Vatican than there is. I've seen things going on in Mecca. I mean, mm -hmm. you got people begging. I've seen and I've heard from brothers who've been there multiple times how you got people who are starving and begging at the, by the Kaaba, man. I mean, how can you have that when you got billions of people, billionaires, creating next to, uh, you know, middle class people? That shouldn't mm -hmm. even be even a thought. Uh, you go to Mecca, it should be marble all over the place and and red carpets all in all over through the valleys. And they got the money to do it. So I, I don't know what you know. This is power. This is pursuit of power and opulence. You know, it's seeped into everywhere. Just a quick comment, Brother Angela. You know, I, I, I said something and I would repeat it, and you might think it's an exaggeration. I've been to the Vatican, not inside. I didn't go inside to that to that sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I feel more at peace there than in the commercial, <laughs> in the commercial atmosphere of Circe, you know, of, of, yes, of, sir. Circe, of Mecca. Yeah, you know, yeah. me, me and the friend, we wanted, we were tired, exhausted. We mm -hmm. just wanted to have tea just tea in, in the cafe of the uh, coffee shop of the Hilton. Guess what? They said, sorry, it's reserved. Because you know what? We will look like poor people dressed in a, you know. And then yes. we we, set, we stepped aside and we noticed, mm. wait a minute, some rich Saudis with beautiful thobes are being let in. Uh-oh. Mm. Because my friend is from India, you know. Mm -hmm. And I don't look Saudi, obviously. And we were not wearing Saudi. You know, we talked to the man. He gave us a, 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 a stupid excuse. We kept yes, seeing yes. the right people let, being let in. So there's, yeah. that's a different story, you know, our experience when we go to these places. But I think that Muslims have the courage to say, wait a minute, going back to the Mus'haf, all of this body of Ajr that was created has nothing to do with the Mus'haf. The Mus'haf mm -hmm. is talking about sacredness. There's no holiness. There's no holy place. Sacredness has to do with protection. It's yes. a very, very practical, pragmatic, direct point. Okay, mm -hmm. that's all. I mean, I mean, you know what? We can, we can talk about the importance of space. Oh, for sure, we can talk about space is essential for any community to develop. We, absolutely, mm -hmm. but let's not call it Islamic. You know what? I want to remind us all of this verse, and I wrote down here, 7218. 7218. You know, Allah says, mm -hmm. The Masajid, whatever the Masajid is, let's just, for now, look at the structure. Al Masajid belong to Allah. Lillah. Okay? فَلَا تَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ أَحَدًا Do not call to the, to, to all, do, do not call anyone else with Allah. That's the simplistic, mm -hmm. minimalistic translation so mm. have them if if we were to believe that whatever these people build around us if they are masajid you know what they control these masajid well according to this verse al masajid allah allah owns these masajid right and i mm. can tell you i can tell you i can write an entire book on my experience with these masajid about us it's about most of them i, I don't want to say all of them there are many good ones but there are many dangerous ones. It's about it's about power and money. Mm -hmm. I'll stop here. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Omar, you want to say something? I would I, like I, to. I, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes. I thought he was talking to me. Sorry. sorry. Oh, <laughs> no. I'll use the last yeah. name. Yeah, Dr. Zaid. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. I'm sorry, I, Doctor. I doctor like before you before you continue, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Angelo. I know you're you're moderating, but your mic being open is creating uh, like a sporadic noises. 
that are really very, every time you move or do this or anything. So I would just ask oh, that okay. you mute, I would ask that you that all of us mute our mics until we're going to say something that would mm. keep all right. the, record, the recording clean. Okay, sure. good. Sure. Okay. Sure. I I um I want to thank you, Brother Ramahi, for your remarks, and uh, I, I want to thank you, uh, Brother Angelo, for your proddings. Um, this is uh, very interesting. I this is this uh, discourse is becoming uh, exactly what I'd hoped it to be, and actually going beyond that. Now, I would like to uh, ask uh, Brother Benjamin to give us a ten-minute dissertation. Nunetics on the nunetics of sacred versus holy, and uh, try to keep to that, uh, Brother Benjamin, because I want Brother Ramahi to do the same thing immediately afterwards. Brother Benjamin? Okay, you... not a problem, not a problem, and it's going to take me much less than 10 minutes because I want to okay. continue hearing from our brother. Yeah. Yes. Um, the difference between sacred and holy is the difference between masculine principle and feminine principle. Mm -hmm. Sacred, as I told you, is related to sacr, which means mm -hmm. male in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. it means zakr, if we're looking at the Arabic, which means male also. Mm -hmm. And the male principle is that which goes out in search of, just like the sperm goes out in search of an ovum mm -hmm. in order to produce future life. Holy, holy, anything that's whole or that's mm -hmm. round or that's oval mm -hmm. is a feminine principle. Mm -hmm. So holy represents that which can be influenced by a masculine principle. I see. That's why I never refer to the Quran as the holy Quran. The Quran is not a feminine entity. Mm -hmm. Allah says, Zalik al kitabu la rayba fihi. <laughs> that is the book in it, it if i didn't say it i'd have to say him in him is no doubt as they mm -hmm. translate it right he mm -hmm. is masculine ha if he had said fi ha that would be feminine so mm -hmm. all of these people who keep saying holy quran holy quran holy quran are incorrect mm -hmm. grammatically mm -hmm. and i see the doctor agreeing with me so yes. that's the difference that the Quran is not something that can be influenced by a, a, an outward. Uh, uh, so there's nothing that can come and take the Quran away from what Allah intended the Quran to be. Mm -hmm. No matter how many revisions or, or, or uh, substitutions of words or shenanigans or whatever, you can't change the essence of what the Quran is as mm -hmm. a message. It's a message that's designed to go out. Mm -hmm. and make changes in the thing that it connects with mm -hmm. <laughs> in this case the human heart and the human brain so it's doing the work that the masculine entity does but it's not being influenced by the torah it's not being influenced by the gospel it's not being influenced by the upanishads it's not being in in influenced by the vedics it's not being interpreted by those past revelations or those past ideas or mythology mm -hmm. it holds its own integrity Yes. And it is in a position to influence the entire world. Uh, and it has been doing that very, very quietly. It's been mm. influencing the entire world of thinkers. That's yes. the difference. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, Professor Ramahi, please, your take on sacred versus holy. Uh uh. You're, we can't hear you. Yeah. There you go. I said, my reference when it comes to anything. Islamic, this adjective never appeared, by the way, in the Mus'haf, Islami, it never. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. if we were to, as humans, create that adjective and attribute it to anything, it has to do with something that emanates from the Mus'haf. Uh, that's, uh, apologize for this phone that is ringing. I have, mm -hmm. It will stop in a second, so my apologies. Sure. Um, yeah, think of it as... Uh, <laughs> Okay, so uh, I I go back to the reference. I go back to the reference, and, and that the fact that we have the reference uh, as the Mus'haf, it has to do with the reference for anything we may put it within the realm of religion. Okay, 
we may put it within the realm with that doesn't mean that there's nothing outside religion of course the religion is like a pointer the religion is a pointer towards huck you know towards science towards sociology mm -hmm. anthropology mm -hmm. economics but the religion is not that okay mm. so when we look at that and we look at the concept of space there's only a few places that that appears okay now i agree with uh, brother bilal i never used holiness i never used it you know muqaddas because if you were to translate holiness into arabic muqaddas i don't know what muqaddas means even the prophet is not muqaddas you know uh, 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 it appears as yeah allah ar ruh al qudus that's how it appears but not al muqaddas not allah ar ruh al qudus was reference to ar ruh al qudus so so having said that having said that is that's our reference there is only al masjid al haram al haram okay holiness i don't see it anymore we try to create we try we try to i'm i'm not i'm not saying there's nothing holy i'm saying you know, there's no concept of holiness in the Mus'haf. Now, the Islam from from its its uh, penal codes, penal codes, to its perspective on many things, it gave to give us a broad perspective, a broad guidelines from which we can jump and change the universe and for the better, and and from which we will have all that energy. Okay, so. Uh, uh, we whatever we whatever comes out of that we cannot call it islamic okay that's my point to 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 islamize things for the sake of power i really mean it for the sake and i emphasize this i put five lines underneath for the sake of creating priesthood because that's what we're doing we're creating priesthood because what is priesthood priesthood is not something theoretical priesthood is someone who has power Yes. Like that's what priesthood right that's what mm -hmm. priesthood. he can marry you he can divorce you he can bless your child whether it's in mm -hmm. christianity mm -hmm. or in islam you know you have to do this bring him to the masjid and make the you know that uh, ceremony when you have a child and all of that has it it created that it created that vocation of priesthood mm -hmm. so that's one the second is that the evolution of this priesthood and i'm reminded of the movie beautiful movie by uh, about uh, yusuf of course it's a movie that the iranians produced uh, several years ago because that brings the concept of priesthood kahana beautifully into 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 light the concept of space the concept of space as as i think brother omar started saying the uh, others have used it the concept of space right others have used it and and the, the christianity precedes uh, uh, the, the the prophethood of muhammad uh, it, when i go to to i like to visit i like to visit churches you tell mm -hmm. me why I'll, you know i can talk about that but partially because of their architecture and the awe that they put inside of you there's an oh mm -hmm. wow space i mean it gives you that holiness feeling whatever holiness <laughs> feeling, right, right? Mm -hmm. so so it it kind of subdues you it kind of subdues you tall, tall buildings if we look at history before the uh, before uh, manhattan came into the scene uh, there were mm -hmm. no tall buildings in history yes right I, I the pyramids and after that i don't know what Mm -hmm. but there were churches churches so when you enter a church wow you have a a, a feeling it, it you're little look, notice you're little okay mm -hmm. you look upward the altar one stage one one floor after the other you look up mm -hmm. so it was a very powerful psychological way to control people in my yes. opinion okay mm -hmm. now Islam came and people started talking in a, in Saudi in a, in a very irrelevant way. They came up with Islamic architecture. And I think this is a ruse. There's no such thing mm -hmm. as Islamic architecture. It's a ruse to deviate people from focusing on what Islam is and start. Well, that's, people. yeah. I'm sorry. That was like, we're talking about sacred geometry, I think. Is that what you're referring to, doctor? Sacred what? Geometry. Sacred geometry. 
Uh, what existed? I, I've ne I never heard that term before, but possibly mm -hmm. because Doctor Zaid, you know, Doctor Zaid, can you confirm that uh, the sacred geometry? I know your experience as a Freemason. The, yeah, yeah. The uh, I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to intrude on what Brother Ramahi is saying about the church. Oh yeah. I think uh, I'll come back to me later, and then I'll. Read okay, yeah, I'll, I'll that, just, that ties in what you're saying. Yeah, but go I'll ahead, just, go ahead, doctor. I'll, I'll just finish it. Is that I'm not denying. I'm not. You know, forgive me. I don't want to yeah. be arrogant to mm -hmm. say, oh, I never heard of it, so it doesn't exist. I, I have a lot to yeah. learn, no, but I'm sure. No, that, it exists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure that I'm sure that when people uh, uh, probably they used all kind of psychological uh, trickery. To, mm -hmm. to, 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 to control people with these spaces. Mm -hmm. Now, Muslims, Muslims, uh, uh, I think, when they started creating spaces in, at the beginning, they realized that we're all one. You know, you stand all in one place. Uh, you st stand in a uniform way. Okay, and of course, I don't believe there's no foundation for that khutbah, Jum'a khutbah. We talked about that earlier, but we're all equal. The place gives you gives you a peace of mind, not mm -hmm. not a sense of awe. Now, it's very interesting to visit. There's still many of these places in India, very old, five hundred mm -hmm. years old. See, you know, in the midst of the hustle and bustle of the city, who could afford? a sanctuary. Not mm -hmm. everyone can afford a sanctuary. Not everyone is yeah. a millionaire to afford a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Delhi, in the midst of Delhi, which is one of the crowded cities in the world, they have these sanctuaries, which the Muslims mm -hmm. built. Believe me, you feel at wow, at peace. Look, you yeah. don't feel, oh, there's a big power ahead of me. No, you just feel at peace. If you mm -hmm. want to worship, if you want to i.e. pray, you can pray if you want to make dhikr, mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. If you want to, guess what? If you want to eat, you can. If you want to relax, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. So, so this is my take on this. Now, Muslims, unfortunately, have deviated from that concept. Deviated from. I'm talking about historically, yes. not as part of the religion, but deviated. So they started when the the advent of Ottomans you know, grandiose empire and power and all of that. And, and mm -hmm. all empires wanted to project their power in those days with building, mm -hmm. right? So yes. they created, they created these, uh, uh, these uh, masajid. Guess what? A copy of the Christian masajid. You know, yes. Hagia Sophia, which I, I disagreed with turning it back as a masjid. I firmly, strongly yes. disagreed and I wrote about this mm -hmm. publicly. Okay. Yeah, Imran Hussein is correct about that. It, it was a, absolutely a political game, mm -hmm. unjustified, even Islamically unjustified. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. It was, but look, they copied across the street, they copied the Blue Mosque. Mm -hmm. they, they copied the aura, the, 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 the domes, the, the, yes. the high uh, pillars. They copied mm -hmm. the same thing. So we yes. went back into. Uh, shock and awe, I call it, <laughs> because when you go inside this, you say, "Wow, this must be real. This is religion. Mm. This is." But the substance, there's no substance. Now, look mm -hmm. at very briefly. Look at the the kings and the emperors. What they've done, Morocco, the biggest masjid, I think the biggest uh, uh, structure in North America is, I think, it's in Morocco, Muhammad al Khamis Masjid. Okay, and guess what? And it is locked except for major occasions. I wanted to see it. Sorry, it's locked. Okay, so so in 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 Pakistan they did something similar. In Dubai they did something. In Abu Dhabi, sorry, not Dubai. In Abu Dhabi, they did a grand masjid. Okay, and this is deviation from the original concepts that Muslims have started long long time ago. So again. Uh, 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 we may read too hard into it, but there's two things. One is that what the Islam says, of, what is the uh, Quran, Mus'haf says about the concept of space. And the second is that how it was used for manipulation to hypnotize people, to make them feel, oh, you're done, you, you, you've done a lot, you've done a lot of good for yourself, but... The, at the end of the day, the impact, 
And because Allah keeps saying, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Right? The impact on the Muslims out of the use of these places is not null. No, 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 no. It's negative. It's absolutely negative. Okay? So, Brother Bilal, the floor. I'm sorry. Brother well, gentlemen, when, you, when you're ready to speak, gentlemen, your, your mics have been muted just because of the noise factor. So just unmute your, your mics when you're ready to speak. Um, thank you, uh, Brother Rahi. This is very interesting. Now, uh, I'm no expert on sacred geometry, the topic of sacred geometry. I know that it is an occult science. And when I say the word occult, I simply mean hidden. It's not something that is taught in the schools. If you want to enter into this realm, you have to enter into the medieval uh, aspects of alchemy that uh, then graduated into what became the Renaissance and the Renaissance men and those architects. We're talking about the, the principles of building that were known to the ancients. Okay, those who, for example, built the pyramids all over the world, this old tech society or whatever it was, we don't know. Some people have uh, knowledge of that based on traditions which have been orally handed down. Others of us, most of us don't know about these things, but we know that they exist. If you look at the, 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 the pyramids, they're not just... Now, some people may call them sacred, but it looks like to me the best explanation I've seen of those spaces is of that which is practical and functional. You see, they're not tombs. Uh, they have, they seem to me to have some sort of um, relationship to the manipulation of power, the manipulation of energy. And it could be hydraulics. It could be some sort of uh, hydro, uh, electric, electric, uh, magnetic waves, uh, and both. I mean, those buildings were there when the place was a fertile uh, territory and was inundated by waters. Okay, so um, it wasn't always the desert that we see here. Now, what I'm saying, I'm bringing that up because. The geometric patterns that were used and the genius that was imbued in such buildings is ancient, ancient. It's old knowledge, but it's been hidden from us. Now, if you if you look at uh, the master architects uh, like uh, Wren, who built uh, some of the greatest buildings in, in London, you see Christopher Wren, he was a Freemason, he was Rosicrucian. He was a, um, uh, an architect, a Renaissance man, a what we call in, in, in some terms, a polymath, someone who knew a lot about many things, <laughs> you see, and was an expert, someone who probably had the equivalent of about 20 PhDs. So this kind of genius is rare. And people like us uh, who uh, try to approach these matters, we may not be qualified yet to handle them. You know, say, oh, oh, what am I talking about? I'm talking about but that purse. I'm still talking about the purse that that Sumerian king uh, was walking around with. All right. Nobody else had that purse. And I'm, I'm not sure, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure he'd let anybody else carry it or touch it. Okay. So we're talking about a, if it's sacred and if it's hidden, it's hidden for a reason. And we know God hides things from us. There are a couple of reasons he do that, you know, I, I keep some things away from my children, okay? And uh, we do that to, yeah. for purposes of safety. So uh, there's something that they're forbidden, okay? Now I'm coming back to what Brother Ramayi was trying to say earlier on. This forbidden aspect of the Masjid Haram, well, you, 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 if something's forbidden, it's there for your protection. Mm -hmm. If you've got the right intention. If you have the wrong intention, 
you see. You can also forbid it, and also make it hidden, you see, and then use it to manipulate people. You can use this hidden knowledge to manipulate people for good or for evil, yeah, for benefit or for harm. And uh, the knowledge, there's nothing wrong with the knowledge. The knowledge itself all proceeds from our source creator. All of this that we might imbue with the sacred geometry, the hexagrams that the honeybees build, hey, it's there for a purpose. It's a very strong uh, structure and it preserves the honey and the honey preserves health. Honey is curative. <laughs> You add it to certain other substances and you study their geometric patterns of formation. You see, you, you've, not, you've got the spiral everywhere following this golden ratio that's in the, the handbag. That's a rectangle there. And you've got the, oh, what is that? That's a rainbow? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Am, am I trying to unwrap the mystery? You bet I am. You bet I am. Okay. Now, I'm just pointing the way here. I'm just trying to point the way. Because there are people who are existing right now on the earth, sharing the same atmosphere and all the same problems as we are, who know these things. And some of them are not teaching them in the correct manner because they're using these principles to manipulate the masses. And this is what we're calling the elitist. Okay, so let me return to the Freemasons. There are genuine Freemasons, okay? And, but they're not the ones that are known by the masses right now. They're not. Okay, they're Freemasons. You can be traced back to the Templars, and the Templars can be traced to um, ancient wisdom that was c carried from those who built the pyramids and other things all over the world. Okay, this forbidden society that's mentioned in the Quran, it said, Go and see, they were greater than you, they did much greater things than you will ever do and look at their end. Okay, so what's the purpose? Our purpose is to find out the sacred knowledge and to utilize it sacredly so that we become whole. Did I say that correctly, ben Benjamin? It's something I mean... like that, okay? Now, if you're not understanding what I'm trying to say, it's you're not whole yet. I'm maybe a little bit closer than some of you, uh, but I'm not whole. I'm on the path. We're all on the path this, this way, this way back to our source creator. And the sacredness is what some of this sacred knowledge has been hidden from us on purpose. So when we talk about sacred geometry, it's not something that uh, we think about in spooky terms. We're talking, hey, you just like be like another a, a, a really hyper motivated 10, 11, 12 year old kid. What is that? I, I want to see what that is. You know, what are you what are you doing there? You want to lift up the rock and look underneath and see what's living there. What 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 made that rock? How does this work? There's nothing. Don't get spooky about it. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, There's not mysticism. No, not mysticism. Go away from no. mysticism. Right. And that's what I love about um, uh, Brother Benjamin when he starts talking, all right, and he gives the nunetic perspective. <coughs> <coughs> all this mysticism that the Sufis have attached to what we consider to be Islam, it just disappears. It ain't there no more. This is just good, practical, useful knowledge that uh, applies to the words that we're using to communicate with each other regarding metaphysical realities which affect the physical reality because what we believe becomes what we do. <laughs> yes, see. and that's, uh, Dr. Dr. Zayed, that's brilliant uh, in, in your exposition on what we're talking about, going back to sacred space, the archetype that you've mentioned in some of your previous lectures uh, ties into what we we're talking about. Uh, I mean, I, I think, as you know, and, and other the panelists might know about the 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 magician 
arch type or whatever they call you know that's one of the ones they use and how yeah. the the the, it, the magician teaches you know about creation and how to about our capacity to bring into reality what Allah wants us to bring into our reality, which is, you know, basically being creators, co-creators with Allah in a sense, uh, by understanding these energies. And uh, we talked about sacred geometry briefly, uh, and from my humble understanding of it, uh, when when uh, uh, Brother Murmahi was talking about the the uh, the structure of the um, the dome. And I think Brother Bilal also mentioned in one of his lectures too about how it, it symbolizes the ovum or the wom woman's womb. So when you're going into a church or you're going into a, a temple, it, you're going into like your mother, your you know, you're, you're becoming, you're going in to get uh, impregnated with the word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then when you come out, you're supposed to be enlightened and you're supposed to bring that out into the world, you know, hmm. to, to, to manifest the glory which is what you're supposed to be enlightened with so these these structures uh, to me they're they're just symbols to help you reflect on what you have inside you already it's like in ancient egypt they talk about the temple of man that temple was a uh metaphorical representation of man you know you you're you're, you're understanding your place in the cosmos by uh contemplating these structures and these these uh, symbols to to convey to your subconscious what you have in you that Allah put in you to to, to bring out of you that, that I just want to say that because it was uh, it was I was inspired to say that because of what your what your comments were on the uh, on the sacred space mm, thank you brother thank you yeah if anybody wants to add to that be my guest <laughs> yes uh I'd like to just add that uh, when we talk about um, sacred geometry, really, it can all be reduced down to lines and curves. That's all the fitra is as a presentation, lines and curves, which in the world of um, <clears throat> symbolism, again, represents the masculine and the feminine. In the word masculine is the word line. It's really masculine, isn't it? And in the word feminine is the word nine, which is the curve, right? It's the pregnancy that delivers mm -hmm. out the shoot. So mm -hmm. masculine and feminine are two principles that this very creation operates upon and one cannot do without the other. So it would, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it would be negligent of me to not mention behind the last comments that I made about the Quran, <clears throat> being sacred and being a masculine mm -hmm. entity, that there is a very significant uh, aspect of the Quran that is feminine. And Allah calls them muhkamat mm mutashabihat. -hmm. Now, any one of you can correct me, but those two words are feminine. Tad marbuta at the end of both of them, right? So the word ayat itself is a feminine word, <clears throat> which means what? What I said earlier, that all feminine things can be influenced by an outside masculine agent. So can the ayat be manipulated? Yes. <laughs> and they have been, but it's up to the masculine to protect it, isn't it? <laughs> the masculine is the protector. So right. when you understand what the Quran is, essentially, it's the protection for the ayat. Mm. What we're doing right now Mm -hmm. is the job of the masculine. Yes. When we're bringing these um, ideas of misinterpretation and, and mistranslation and we're bringing mm -hmm. it before you and we're putting the corrections on them, we're protecting the integrity of the ayat of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the same as a man protecting the integrity of his woman or his wife. Why? Yes. Because she's the one who's going to bear the future generations for this man. She's the yes. one keeping him here. So it's the same thing mm -hmm. with what we're doing with knowledge. Yes. We are masculine thinkers. We are dhikr. Doing dhikr. Mm -hmm. For the purpose of protecting the integrity of the knowledge that Allah is gifting us yes. with. We're not just to let it be uh, mishandled by anybody who wants to put their hands on it or by anybody who wants to say that it says this when you know it doesn't say that. 
we're the mm. ones who have to bring the corrections on that. So the, mm. the Quran itself is a balance of the masculine, the sacred, and the feminine ayat that the masculine is charged with protecting. So I, I hope mm -hmm. that that is yeah. clear. Now in the Quran, yes. in the Quran, the previous revelations are given feminine gender. Um, Dr. Ramahi, am, am I correct in saying that? When it speaks about the Torah and the Injil, it 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 refers to them as ha, ha min ha from the feminine. But when it refers to the Quran, it's again Valik al Kitab la Raiba fihi Hudalin Mutatin. So it differentiates between the gender, if you will. <clears throat> I don't like to use that word, but it differentiates mm -hmm. between the principles of masculine mm -hmm. principle and feminine principle when it comes to mm -hmm. distinguishing between the Mus'haf and the mm -hmm. previous revelations. So I wanted to put oh, that gosh. in there also, which means uh -huh. what? That they can be very heavily influenced by outside agents, and they have been. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the Torah became the Talmud, in essence. Mm -hmm. Yes. The yeah, Injil, so the Injil, yeah, the Injil, exactly. Mm -hmm. The Injil mm -hmm. <laughs> became the four Gospels, <laughs> Matthew, Mark, mm -hmm. Peter, and uh, whatever the last one's name is. Not the, mm -hmm. meaning, no disrespect. John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and mm -hmm. John, yeah. yeah so, yeah. and the Apocrypha. And and mm -hmm. in our day and time, what we know as the Quran, because of some very shrewd manipulation, was intended to be turned into Hadith. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whereas the majority of Muslims on earth right now are following hadith, not Quran. That's correct. In the Quran, mm -hmm. Muhammad is, is stated as saying, my people have abandoned this Quran, had al Quran. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In his time, not after, not 250 right. years after, in his yeah. lifetime they did, they started that mess. Yes. So we, again, are charged, no matter how far into the future we go, we are charged with protecting the integrity of that masculine principle called mm. the Quran that is intended to go out in search of the right recipients, the right receptacles so that they may become engaged, committed and evolved as humans. That's what the Quran's main purpose is, is to evolve humans, mm. not to keep us at a particular level of development in history, but to evolve us from the inside out, mm. not from the outside ritualistic way of uh, trying to make people just have the awe Right, but mm, right. not not the substance. And when we leave, so, bro, the, when we leave, yeah. when we leave the building, we yeah. we feel we feel less holy. <laughs> right. So, brother Bala, you mentioned before that you it's like you're getting meat as opposed to getting breastfed all the time. You you have to evolve into eating meat. Mm. Well, it 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 involves right? all it, it involves all the levels of feeding. You know, depending mm. on what level you're at, mm. you right. might need you might need the milk and the colostrum. Mm -hmm. But the person, yeah, oh, grown, yeah. the person who's grown teeth, which is not the majority of the Muslim world, <laughs> mm -hmm. we're, we're still toothless looking for mm -hmm. a titty. We're just mm -hmm. we're still looking for titties in the world. But we we're trying to strive we, to be me. We're trying to strive to be and get out of that child mentality to go some, to eat and eat. Some mm -hmm. of us, for many of us, the titty is still so comfortable. <laughs> it's so easy to digest, you know. Yes. Yeah, but we got to come out of that, man. Well, mm -hmm. that's 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 your thinking mind telling you that. But look mm -hmm. at the majority of the Muslim world and tell me where we are right now. <laughs> that's all we why have do, to learn. Why do, to... why do we get the flack we get? Because we're trying to get you to grow some teeth. <laughs> that's right. When we're trying to get to the teeth, the meat doesn't matter right now. This is yeah, good. Right. Did you have something to say, brother Rahi? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's so much. You have to, you know, I'm an academic uh, through and through, so you have to stop me. We're paid to keep talking, so just uh, <laughs> so don't ever ask me, do you have anything to say? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, whether it all makes sense or not, that's a different story, okay? Yeah, yeah that's a different story. So, but, yeah. uh, I, I want to try to tie a few things together so that we sure. can maybe, maybe connect the dots and... and uh, uh, Dr. Omar, I, I see your, uh, your, your, your thoughts, maybe where you're heading about uh, knowledge that we may not know, uh, things uh, that we may not know. And, and the Mus'haf, you know, is so powerful in that. Um, 
uh, I'm reminded of two things. Uh, you know, when you talked about the geometry, the the masons, and all of that. The first thing is that um, is that uh, the story of Suleiman is very powerful. You know, Allah, Allah, the the the, the space in the Mus'haf is so precious, and when Allah creates something, Allah created this book. He was very careful, if I put it mildly, what to include in it or not, <laughs> you know. Yes. And uh, when he talked about Suleiman and he said uh, he understood what the ants are saying. Mm-hmm. My goodness, nowadays, we, this is way advanced than what we know right now. We, you know, the most uh, advanced thing is that there's a, in engineering and technology is something called ant uh, optimization routine that is based on the, how the ants walk. So apparently the ants walk in a very, very efficient way. Very mm-hmm. efficient way. And mm-hmm. this is what we got to. That's it. Okay. Now, uh, Suleiman could understand, you know, uh, what uh, they were communicating. He understood. He intercepted. If I were put it in, in countermeasures technology, he intercepted their talk, their mm. communication, not their talk necessarily, but their communication. So Mm -hmm. uh, what does this tell us is that there were times when people had very, very advanced knowledge or some people, the other Mm -hmm. thing. So we're not, we we cannot deny this. Uh, We we cannot know it from history. The only way to to know it is from the Mus'haf. Another thing is, uh, is uh, uh, the, the, the other, other nations, you know, uh, uh, at the time of Isa, uh, the prophet Isa, uh, medicine was the biggest technology. Medicine was the end thing. And uh, uh, Musa, before Isa, Allah told him how to bring the dead, how how to bring, to make someone dead back into a living entity. Now, interesting, very interesting. Is it, does that tell us that it, one day we can bring the dead someone who's dead back to life within within certain reasons, within certain circumstances, possibly. Uh, we are so advanced in certain things. But if you look at these certain things, if you look at the chip technology, chip mm-hmm. microprocessor technology, it's based on very, very simple principles, very, very simple principles. But the system is complex, not difficult, complex. What is difficult and both complex is the software. That's where the, 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 the challenges are. But the, the chip itself, the miniaturization, the principles are simple. Okay. Now, in history, and, and, and so, so, so to answer that question, we have a lot to know. Now, mm. you know, when I was sitting and doing this, uh, a student gave me this beautiful ring. And she said, this protects you from hasad. You know, so I'm putting it, flashing it in front of you. So, so, so I don't know. You know, I, I really don't know. You know, what we don't know, we cannot say anything about. But we cannot deny. You know, I, I don't know. There's no proof that a turquoise ring will attract, will pre- protect me. I don't know. Okay. Now, can I deny that it protects me? I don't know either. You know, so so in, in all modesty, I leave it at that. Now, the the anything anything that is built on secrecy, I have no trust in it. Mm-hmm. It 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 invalidated itself from the beginning. It was born invalid. Okay, the Freemasons, from what I understand, they were the Masons. They were the highest technology people. You know. Uh, 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 and in those days, buildings were the end thing. Mm. Uh, when I was in Illinois, I learned that there are very, very prestigious clubs in Chicago. How I came mm. across that one time I was in downtown Chicago and I peeked through one door. Oh, my God, as if you looked into a palace. This is downtown Chicago. And I inquired. I found out that this is a special club for certain business people. And, and You're talking the- about the L Club? The Elk uh, Club? I really don't know. I remember it was oh. off Michigan Avenue in one of those uh, narrow alleys. And mm. uh, 
That's the Elk Club, I think. Possibly. I live close to there, actually. <laughs> Are you a member, brother? <laughs> yeah, it's a palace inside. Yeah, it's all marble inside. Uh, so, I live right next door. I live right by there. <laughs> very interesting. You know, my, my yeah. question, anything that is based on secrecy is invalid, in my opinion, because they're trying to have power based on hypnotization of people. If, if mm. it's, it, you know, if, if it's not, uh, it, 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 why the secrecy? Why? You know, uh, when... when I, well, I, yeah. I, I asked people, I teach here at the Waterloo, and I told the students something which is wrong. And I dramatized it. I was, this is second course electrical circuit, nothing, no big deal, not philosophy. But I dramatized the way I did it. I told them something false, wrong. And then I stood like this and I said, you see, guys, I'm telling you the best because I am your prof. I care about you. Mm -hmm. Any Any questions so far? Mm. And they were top students in the class. Any questions? Should I move forward? You know, I started mm. seeing thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Then I paused and I said, I was wrong. I said, I hypnotized you. Mm. I, I don't know what hypnotization is. I just used that word. I said, I hypnotized you. They said, uh, why do you say that? I said, because when, how do you, I said, how do you know when you're hypnotized? Nobody answered. I said, when you stopped asking questions. Mm. You, know, that, you know that I yeah that's one know. of the symptoms yes <laughs> absolutely right you know uh, and, right, right. and when, whenever there is something secretive there's a cabal you know when mm. the the rabbi starting the writing the talmud it's the same as when the muslim rabbi starting writing the hadith yes you know mm -hmm. uh, we know better Oh, we know better. We have our methodology is so powerful. And, and look at this. It's a, it's a circular logic. You can't get out of it. To criticize us, you have to be in us, within us. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Th that, by the way, this is it. I'm, I'm not joking. That's no. how they say it. They say, no, 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 it's okay. You can criticize the hadith, but you have to be, you have to follow our methodology. Mm. You know, this is rubbish. Absolutely. You know, the U.S., Let's let's look at facts. You know, we look at facts before we look at the Mus'haf, by the way. Mm -hmm. If we don't look at facts, the Mus'haf means nothing. Okay? F the Mus'haf came to support reality facts, not the other way around. Okay? So if we look at the Mus'haf, if we look at facts, the U.S. decisively won World War II. Decisively. There's no conspiracy about it. Right? How mm -hmm. did they win it? By bombing their enemies to smithereens literally evaporating their enemies. Uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Dresden. And spies. They, they, they <laughs> evaporated their, their enemies. How did they do it? By, by, uh, by the magic of the Hasad or the turquoise ring, science and technology which is extremely transparent. Extremely mm. transparent. You get it first, you dominate, period. Mm. That's mm. it. So, so secrecy, you know, this secrecy, this this illusion, and, and subhanAllah, we go back to this fundamental concept of what is all Islam about, is to focus on reality, stay away from illusion. Mm. It's, it's as simple as that. It takes that's us, right, I agree. That's, it. And that's the most thing. If it, so we talked about, sorry, just a, a one line, we talked about priesthood. It's the most dangerous thing, and we inherited it from Muslims inherited it from uh, from uh, Judaism and Christianity. And, you know, in mm -hmm. fact, I was reading a very interesting paper, amazing paper. The person, the woman who wrote it, obviously is not thrilled about Islam. You can see a lot of bias. But there's a lot of powerful information. She used to be a researcher at, she's a Harvard graduate. She used to be at Temple University. I forgot her name for now. But she, she her claim was, according to that uh, historical records that she studied, is that Islam is a copy of Judaism. Hence, mm -hmm. hence, it's it's a, a fake religion or there's nothing to it because that's the mm -hmm. implicit underlying, you know, line. I found it to be powerful because mm -hmm. what I concluded is that exactly the parallel religion was copied mm -hmm. <laughs> from the Talmudic Judaism. Yes. Was copied. To the point, you know what? To the point the six... Sihah is comparable to the six books in, in the Talmud. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And, yes. and, and on and on and on. So, yes. so it's natural that people copied, copied mm -hmm. things. Okay. Uh, so 
Islam is a liberating force. Islam is against, you know, when it comes to Sufism, before we talk, because Sufism was mentioned, uh, I don't like to, to go further into without, without asking ourselves, what's the definition of Sufism, you know, mm. because the definition is so elastic, so expansive. Right. Yeah. And well, that, I, I'd like to I like that's a that's a whole other conversation. I know I'd like to bring it back to where you talk about sacred space again. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to also mention that secret societies have been with us since the beginning of man's culture, because, you know, even Islam was secret at one time. But we grew out of that. And so did Christianity. They had to be secret or else they'd be killed. Right. Uh, but the problem with the, these secret societies today, they, they haven't grown out of that. And they still stay with that boy scout, boy scout mentality. You know, you got to be one of us to get these secrets or whatever. But we don't have any secrets in Islam. We have the truth and the guidance, the Quran. At the top levels, from my understanding, research to um, Freemasonry, they, they study Islam at the higher levels. They have to know about the battles of Muhammad. They have to know about certain uh, characters in Islamic history. Uh, that's telling us something that we have something that they need, they want, but but we have it. Allah gives us to us when you know He graces us if we're uh, if we're you know qualified, and if you know we're blessed to do that. Uh, but secret societies, you know, they're they they don't have much in the secrets that you know are going to be enlightening than what we're talking about now. Some of the things, you know, and 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 also we're not very much different than the ancient people because. Uh, the different ancient cultures, they had knowledge that actually we, a lot of our knowledge today comes from them. So, uh, yeah. you know, we have to, we have to understand that we're not much evolved more than our ancient ancestors. You know, we just got more toys and this and that, you know, but uh, studying ancient history and stuff is, to me, it's always been fascinating because it, it brings you back to the fitrah, which were our natural state, which Allah gives us and the Quran tells us. So, you know, studying these ancient people we can learn from them and their mistakes you know and like you said mentioned other uh dr Maha, you had mentioned how you know th there were cultures that were more advanced than we were today and and, and dr omar zaid you also mentioned how uh, you know the quran mentions how there were greater nations than we have been today that that just has vanished because you know maybe they just forgot allah or that they forgot themselves because if you forget yourself i mean if you forget allah Allah will make you forget your own self. That's what it mm -hmm. says in the Quran. So mm -hmm. I guess remembrance is something that I, I, I strongly want to say with the sacred space. We opened up with sacred space and uh, how we should approach this. Really, we should approach ourselves as sacred in a sense of Allah puts in us something sacred, you know, from mm -hmm. him. He, he gave Adam life with his, what was it? He breathed life into him. That's when... Iblis became upset. So I guess we have to remember that. Can I say just quickly, you see the concept yeah, go ahead, man. of haram. haram. Mm. Uh -huh. It looks like we just lost him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, he must have yeah. cut out. Your, your camera froze, Ramahi, Ramahi if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, he froze up. We'll, we'll, we'll wait for uh, him to come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but see, because I, I think we were going a different tangent. I mean, we we're going off in other things, and I didn't want to, because I know how long you want to keep going. It's almost 1 o'clock. Um, yes, I, I, we, we need to wrap up, because I don't want to exhaust our listeners, and, and let alone ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. If uh, Brother Mahi comes yeah, back. I think he's coming back. Yeah. yeah, he's back. Okay, very good. Brother Mahi, we... Um, have to uh, i think we should close now and uh, save your remarks for our next session i i found this very fruitful and uh, it's opening uh, uh, an awful lot of topics for further discussion things i think that many people maybe consider passively but never actively and I, i'd like to uh, just say a closing remark about this um this uh, word sacred um, uh, as the brother uh, Bilal said, uh, reminded us it comes from this word that has something to do with soccer or seker. And in the ancient Hebrew, to my understanding, that means that was one of the words they used to define uh, or to describe a wise man. It is, so it's completely 
masculine. And when we're talking about what is sacred, um, we're also talking about something that is, now we know it's masculine, which makes it anything that's sacred is an active principle. It's based on an active principle. That means action is going to take place, some sort of activity. So if we're approaching what is sacred in a sacred place, we're preparing ourselves to do the right thing, in summary. And so I, I'd like to just uh, keep that uh, as a close, my closing remark, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll manage to do this again, perhaps once a month, uh, you know, the... The, the four of us here or whoever else is uh, available and to join us. I, I want to have open webinars too, where we, we can invite a listening audience and entertain some of their Q and a um, next week. We hopefully, if you can join us, I would like to have this webinar and, and follow up Q and a with them on the topic of sexology, but Hey, we can't get away from sexology. Can we? Everything's in terms of, male and female, and I'm not just talking about gender. We have to uh, incorporate the male and the female principles back into our metaphysical wholeness, right? So that's a, that's a sacred activity. <laughs> we, have to, we have to invest in this wholeness so that uh, what is sacred can complete the human being in those terms. And uh, so uh, those are my closing remarks, uh, Brother Ramahi. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share these thoughts. You know, we, 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 um, uh, we hope to contribute to a dialogue, an honest and sincere and transparent, uninhibited dialogue on these mm. issues amongst Muslims. And if this contribute, uh, you know, we, we have this is a successful program. That's all mm -hmm. from my mm -hmm. end. You know, we we need to be opinionated. You know, we need to have a bias. That's that's the nature of science and investigation. One has one needs to start with a bias, and okay. if one continues with it, and they find that their bias is wrong, that's where the courage is to say, you know, I've been off. But yes. uh, without the bias, there's no no starting point. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, Brother Bilal. Yes, uh, just in my concluding remarks, um, those of you who want to continue referring to the Quran as holy, just understand in your mind that you should spell it W-H-O-L-L-Y. <laughs> that it is holy. <laughs> and make sure that the Quran you're referring to is holy. Now, if there's something else in it that doesn't belong in it, some other opinion, some other saying, some other reference, you got to extricate that from the wholeness of the Quran. It comes complete, it comes fully detailed according to Allah in the Quran. So we can have a holy Quran, we can have a sacred Quran, or we can use any of the references that Allah gives to the Quran. All right, so let's just keep that in mind. It's a delicate balance of both. Yes. Thank you, and uh, just great being with all of you guys once again. Alhamdulillah. Uh, inshallah, in the future, we're going to have some female spokespersons for I hope so. Um, Inshallah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are great thinkers among us. And, yes. Uh, we, we must include them in the very near future. My God, I've been waiting for them, waiting, yeah. waiting. Thank waiting. you. Thank you all to my yeah. to all my learners. I see a bunch of you <laughs> learners from the uh, yes. genetics class yes. in the audience. Yes. Thank, and thank you. you for being with mm -hmm. us, and I'll see you again tonight in the main class at 7. Very good. Brother Angelo, you want to close us out? Can't hear you. Uh-uh. All right. It's open, but we can't hear him. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see. He's muted. There we go. All right. Try now, Angela. Still can't no, hear him. Still can't hear him. Yeah. He must be muted his end. All right. Okay. You can hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Rabbana atina fit dunya hasanatan wafila khirati hasanatan waqina adab and nar. Once again, thanking you for all of us for being with us today. And inshallah, we'll see you again. Uh, uh, Dr. Omar, just understand that next Sunday I'm going to be traveling. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So I won't be able to participate. So just factor that into whatever you need for me to do. Same, same with me. I will be traveling actually to the West Coast starting Saturday. Okay. So I will not. That's, that's fine. We can put it off until you gentlemen can join us. Maybe All two right. weeks. That's fine. Very yeah. kind. Of, very kind. Uh, very good. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.